Well, again, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Justin, and uh, for thinking about me for this Return and Learn, uh, the last one, it sounds like, for this academic year. Um, I am a community health nurse. Uh, I teach at um, Moravian College. I've been there for about 16 years now. Uh, and it's, it's just been a, 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 an amazing experience and a lot of personal professional growth uh, bringing this idea of community health, community health nursing, um, and now epidemiology and bioinformatics um, to, you know, to, to students, to learning communities who really just are, are taking off and, and running with this kind of thing. Community health is just so important. Um, and, and so I, I've really kind of, from my experience in being there for 16 years now, really developed a passion for global health. Um, so I know some of your other, you know, lecturers may have pre pre um, presented some of their, you know, um, current um, research and things like that. But I'd like you to think of mine more as maybe like a descriptive case study type of evidence. And um, my real hopes moving forward in a new academic year are that we will be returning to our educational innovation, which is our service learning project in Honduras this coming spring 2022, keeping my fingers crossed. Um, and also just recognizing, I think the idea that the college really has a renewed interest in all aspects of study abroad. And it's really um, a, a, an important part I see of um, educating um, you know, future global citizens and, um, and part of Moravian's um, strategic plan. So um, just to get us started, um, you know, the world's really been making great progress improving human health over the last 50 years. Um, I'm not going to back things up to, you know, that that long ago, but let's just take it back 25 years. Start to think of your context then. Um, how old were you? Were, you know, how old were your children? Did you have grandchildren already? Um, what was your home like? And think about your health, okay? Um, think about that time in, in the 90s here. So we're gonna back things up to about 25 years, think about the 90s, and then we're gonna take a trip forward to what's really been the biggest roadblock in the journey for health for all, this pandemic. Um, look at just, uh, you know, uh, we could be here for uh, an entire semester looking at issues, um, but we're gonna talk about a setback and hopefully also connected to this educational innovation that is service learning and this um, trip to um, Honduras. So I'll be talking a little bit about that as well. So, you know, think about um, you younger um, uh, members here. Maybe you remember Barney or Reading Rainbow, Family Ties, Full House, other, others of us might remember NYPD Blue, Friends, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, all those kinds of things. Those are some of the things. Think. So kind of get yourself in that context of what was going on in the 90s. Um, there's a US Times uh, reporter uh, that um, really talked about the 90s as, um, and he, uh, you know, his op-ed was, this was really one of the best decades ever. Um, America was really uh, experiencing a lot of prosperity then. Um, so, you know, here again, books we were reading. Uh, Harry Potter, Ronald Reagan's American Life, Angela's Ashes, um, for some of you youngsters, Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You'll Go, The Rainbow Fish, Goodnight Gorilla, and Goosebumps. So, you know, think about this time and this, pro you know, prosperous country that we were living in. Economic growth was increased by 4%. Jobs had been added. Um, about 1.7 million a year in the 90s, which then resulted in a real decline in um, unemployment. Um, the median household income increased, the poverty rate declined, the stock market was on the rise, there was a decrease in violent crimes. There was actually, I just can't even imagine this, but there was a federal bu budget surplus. And there was a decrease in HIV and AIDS related um, deaths. So Kurt Anderson would call this the best decade e ever. Um, and that kind of goes along with another article that I'm gonna talk about, about um, really how um, global health has improved over the past, um, you know, let's say 20, 25 years or so. 
One thing um, Kurt did point out was the digital age was fully underway. Many of us started with our first computers or access to one in the 90s. And we ended the 90s with laptops, cell phones, and worldwide access. Although, and I liked his quote, we were not overconnected or tyrannized by our devices. Uh, an interesting aspect of thinking back to the 90s. Um, you know, we're watching movies like Forrest Gump, you know, there's The Lion King, Home Alone, The Sandlot, Prince of Egypt, Mighty Ducks, Beauty and the Beast. So movies from back then. But uh, again, take yourself back to that time and let's go forward from there and think about some global highlights that occurred, especially back in the 90s. When you hear some of these, you might really um, kind of reflect on, you know, our current situation. About 20 countries joined the ranks of the world's free countries in, in this um, decade of the 90s. South Africa peacefully dissembled apartheid. Israel and Palestine negotiated a peaceful coexistent, coexistence. China entered into the world theater. The US um, campaign in 100 hours uh, drove um, Saddam Hussein's army out of Kuwait. And it was the start of post-Soviet Russia. One really interesting thing is that since the 1990s, voters in Russia's election um, probably have never known any other leader other than Putin. Just really kind of some interesting things. So now let's fo go forward, okay? Think about the 90s. Now we're gonna move forward. And um, a couple of the um, really kind of important um, progress um, metrics that we can see here. Um, I have them here and then um, really take that take us up to, unfortunately, the situation that we're in, we are in now with the, um, the pandemic. So the 90s were, you know, according to Anderson and many other people probably agree, one of the best decades ever. Um, and it also was this idea of um, global health's golden age. And a lot of it was due to some of the um, aspects that you see here as well. Um, people live longer in countries with a higher GDP per capita, or if you put it differently, in countries with longer lives, the GDP per capita is higher. So that connection between health and wealth doesn't really tell us wh which that goes, comes first, but th it's very much important and part of this whole global health golden age. Um, as incomes rise, countries can move forward economically and then the other things that they start to work on, especially in some developing countries is things like, we, things that we take for granted, sanitation, safe water, food and education. Um, but you know, we always need to reflect on too, the idea that income doesn't mean everything. We see that as we, we spend a lot of money on healthcare, but we lag behind on some health indicators when we compare ourselves not to those developing countries, but to other high income peers. Um, a lot of time and progress in, in this golden age actually increased knowledge of health and disease and some new health technologies and interventions and getting them out across the globe meant in many cases, um, you know, these were simple cost-effective tools that were used. So ORT is oral, uh, oral rehydration it's the treatment for severe dehydration due to diarrheal disease found in children. It's been used since the 60s, but during this golden age, we were really able to expand it and, and take it out to lots of places in the globe. Vitamin A supplementation um, contributed to decreases in blindness. Um, even just some of those simple things like um, bed nests for malaria. Um, helped um, and became one of those um, first line prevention programs for malaria as um, in the 80s and 90s, we worked on some new anti-malarials that are now part of the treatment. And then the other thing, um, you know, certainly it was very important was um, since 1995, many new medications for the treatment of HIV, lots of combination therapy is out there, um, developing one, one pill and three combos and we're working really well that at this point, more than half the world um, globally has access to antiretroviral therapy. Vaccines are a big, important part of um, uh, you know, progress in global health. 
um, vac vaccines have eradicated smallpox. And the World Health Organization has a core group of vaccines that save two to three million um, children a year. The other thing that happened during this global health, um, this golden age, is this idea of um, kind of a, I'm calling it combination therapy. I think Misha that, um, talked about this as well. Like um, this idea of being really committed to health. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's not just, um, you know, uh, therapy taking place at local, national and international levels by individuals, but it's this idea that as a world, we really got on board with social activism, political leadership and financial commitment um, that really took health far during this golden age. Um, many programs and companies came together to partner on programs like Gavi, the Global Alliance on Vaccines, um, programs to combat HIV AIDS, malaria, all totaled international assistance went up from 7 billion in 1990 to 37 billion in 2016. So here you can see some of those um, really interesting um, aspects of how um, increased knowledge, technology, and also um, many um, players coming together and being committed to health and health across the globe really um, contributed to, as Misha would, would um, describe this, the golden age of, of health. Um, so that kind of brings us to just a, a couple of basic statistics here. Um, population growth, it, you know, it is still growing. You can see um, at present we are at about 7.8 billion, but it's actually growth has slowed a little bit. Um, right now in about 2020, um, we're experiencing about 1% growth where, you know, back in the 70s, um, we were, you know, obviously we were um, experiencing a, a, a higher population growth, um, about 2% um, increase. Births, as you can see, um, you know, in, um, in 2020, uh, about um, 140 million babies were born. Um, again, in some cases, and it's really interesting to think about this, back in 1995, 132 million babies were born, but 80% of the world's population lived in developing countries, many in, in extreme poverty. And that is, um, extreme poverty is listed as person who makes about $1.25 a day. 2020 estimates are about 70%. So uh, of that 140 million, about um, half of that, uh, about 70% of the million of babies born are living in, um, in places like Asia Af and Africa versus a very small number, about 4 million um, in North America. So population is growing slowly. Birth rates are, are in, you know, growing slowly as well. Um, so, um, you know, people were living longer too. You can see here the life expectancy, the global average really has, um, has increased as well during this time. The next few slides are just gonna give us some comparisons. Um, when we look at uh, some of these um, child survivals and a maternal metric of note, um, and just think about um, some of the differences that we're going to see um, based on looking at a couple of these slides. So there still is disparity over where this life expectancy truly is taking place. Um, and, um, and those, um, you know, 72 years and more are, are, are pretty much the norm in some countries, but not in others. So this is, um, this is from a global health textbook that I use. And here you can see um, this idea of life expectancy as, as at birth. There's been great strides, but we can see that the disparity here, that there's a gap of 19 years really um, which is actually, um, the gap is closing. It's down from 22 as it was in 2013. But there's still real disparity here. Um, in, in, as we can see there, um, on where the um, life expectancy is lower than in other areas. Um, some real significant differences when you think about this too, 
Um, a male in Afghanistan right now has a life expectancy of about 57, while a man living in um, Denmark, uh, his life expectancy is about 72. A woman in Sierra Leone, um, her life expectancy right now is about 54 years, where in Japan, a woman uh, a woman's life expectancy is about 84, a 30 year difference. Um, so sometimes we look at some other measurements just to see what are these differences and, and, and see where the real um, differences or disparities are, are occurring. So that brings me to this idea of maternal mortality rates. Um, this is um, the rate of deaths associated with childbirth in very poor countries where women have low status and few facilities in their healthcare systems that really can address obstetric emergencies, the ratios can be as high as 700 per 100,000. Uh, and that's an, uh, a 2016 number um, that um, we find in places like Central Africa Republic, Liberia, Nigeria, Somali, Somalia, and, and South Sudan. Um, some of the associated issues with this um, are early marriage, early and repeated pregnancy with no spacing of children. And these things can, can be factors or attributed to um, sometimes a chronic um, health condition of, of obstetric fistula, especially in some resource poor um, health systems where um, obstetric fistula you know, really, it really cannot be, um, uh, you know, treated at this point. But more importantly, things like obstructive labor um, really can add to that maternal mortality rate, as well as anemia, um, you know, making a, making a um, conditions for, um, you know, the mother who's having repeated pregnancies, um, really putting her at risk as well as um, her, her children. So here's another quick um, stat just to look at. Again, you can see there's been a lot of progress, uh, but neonatal mortality rates really refer to deaths during those 30, first 28 days of life per 1,000. They are trending downward. They've really about halved in these past 25 years. But again, you can see the disparity there. Um, it varies with the income level of the country. Um, poorer countries typically have increased neonatal mortality. And, and many times it's associated with issues related to the health of the mother. Um, and then also whether or not the birth was attended or um, took place in, in, within a healthcare system rather than um, you know, having a, um, a local uh, midwife or, or village woman who um, assists with the birth. Um, after that, um, those two numbers, one of the numbers that we really look at is under five mortality rate. Especially when we see, and we did see such improvement in the neonatal um, rates, typically um, connect to attended births and good prenatal care. Um, then you start to look at under five rates and look at what's the, you know, what's the why of this issue? Why is this occurring? Um, in some of the least developed countries, these numbers are quite high. Um, a, a, a country of Chad, for example, um, their under five mortality rate is 125 out of 1,000. Um, some of the killers in low-income countries for those under five children are malaria is number one, um, lower respiratory infections, number two, and diarrheal disease, number three. Um, when we think about lower respiratory infections, a lot of that has to do with indoor air pollution um, and, you know, um, children um, living in, and playing and um, existing in a home with a, a fire that's unvented um, for, for heat and for um, food prep. Diarrheal disease, a lot of that relates to things like unsafe water, poor sanitation, and poor hygiene. There's still so much more to do. Um, and these are just some of the statistics that, that um, go, go do, towards the issues that still need to be taken care of. Um, we are seeing uh, changes in, um, it's called an epidemiologic transition as well, and the rise of non-communicable diseases. As countries move into more developed stages, um, they adopt, an, unfortunately, a Western lifestyle. And so then um, some of the top three risk factors contributing to death 
are things like hypertension, poor diet and smoking. Um, there's other growing challenges. Um, I know I've um, traveled around um, Honduras, Haiti and the Dominican and um, uh, motor vehicles. Um, uh, it's, it's a whole different way of moving about the country than what we're used to here. And so there are a number, there are lots of accidents and um, unfortunately, healthcare systems that aren't prepared to deal with the trauma that can occur from that. Um, so again, within countries, there's lots of inequalities. Rural areas have little access. Um, and I'll show you some pictures um, from, from some of my um, adventures that I've had. Um, this picture is a picture of a few women in Haiti watching clothes in the same stream where water is gathered for cooking and drinking. It really makes me think too of not only the issues of sanitation, clean water, you know, um, uh, you know, having having water in it, a water system and a sanitation system within your village, but it also makes me think upstream of working on social um, social determinants of health, factors that affect health where we live, work, play, and are educated. And it's really important for us as global citizens to understand some of the social determinants of health. Globally, about 23% of deaths and 26% of deaths among children under five are due to preventative uh, environmental factors. Remember things like malaria, um, uh, you know, cooking inside in an unvented stove, and then the aspect of diarrheal disease, thinking about um, clean water and sanitation. This is another picture from Haiti. Um, this is actually, um, I went with uh, youth from my, um, my uh, local faith community um, and we worked in an orphanage in, in Haiti. Um, this is a picture of a new type of um, orphanage that's going to use the family approach that was being built and, and conceptualized with this orphanage that um, largely um, at some point had been um, you know, children are brought to the orphanage when um, families can't take care of their children anymore, or some of them were orphaned from the big earthquake. Um, but anyway, the land in Haiti is really barren. Um, most of the trees have been taken and used for fires for cooking or maybe, um, you know, develop, you know, making a house, things like that. So most of the land really is very barren and dusty like this. There wasn't the reforestation program um, certainly hasn't taken place. But when you think about this, you know, uh, the other thing about this, this makes me think about occupational health and safety. So when we think about our work environment, we have uh, a government system that really um, addresses health and safety for the worker, but really in a developing country like Haiti, um, you know, that, that doesn't really uh, exist. Um, another, uh, really serious part of this whole family approach that's being um, built for rescue and rehab of young children. Um, these children may have been enslaved. Um, as, at young ages, they um, were um, bought um, to carry water, do household chores, cooking, or even possibly be trafficked or sexually abused. This is a picture that um, just reminds me of overcrowding. Um, this was my um, view on the way to the orphanage every day. No matter where you live, it's important to know that people who live in poverty are more likely to be exposed to environmental hazards due to crowded living, lack of sanitation or disposal of waste or things like pollution, poor quality of available food, and working in hazardous jobs. Um, thinking of jobs, that takes me on, uh, uh, I'll just show you a couple slides from a trip to the Dominican Republic. This is a sugarcane um, plantation. Um, I'm part of an NGO that worked to take um, a global health initiative out to the sugarcane um, workers in the Baytays. Um, and many Haitians crossed the border into the Dominican Republic and cut sugarcane um, for about $20 a ton, or another way of looking at it. They um, work 14 hour days, seven days a week, making about $5 a day um, when it's time to harvest the sugarcane. Um, living on the plantations, they need to purchase everything from the landowner. In many cases, in a family, um, everyone's cutting um, sugarcane and children may be left unattended. Here's a picture of one of the 
sugar workers' towns or the um, Beites, um, they're still living in huts. Um, you know, the deforestation issue in Haiti, um, you know, the other side of the Isle of Hispaniola is not as evident in, in the DR as I'm there, as I could um, recall. Um, latrines are present, but there's no clean water, no bed nets, no dirt, you know, they're living on dirt floors. Um, and, one, and one of the things that was kind of interesting was there was a group there from Georgia that was actually constructing a water closet, which is a well, um, at the intersection of a few of these betes. So these, um, one of the most important things we can do is give people good clean water. Um, I look a little rugged here, but this is life out on a global mission trip. Um, this is a 70 plus year old woman. It's amazing um, to go out um, into some of these rural areas like Honduras and Haiti and Dominican and, um, and just, um, you know, meet someone who is actually in their 70s. Um, she was in amazingly good health, but I towered over her by at least a foot. Um, there's was no medical care brought to this Beite for four, four or five years, I think. Um, when I think about this idea of, of you know, she was this um, tiny, short statured woman, that makes you think about the malnutrition issue of stunting. Um, where we start to see children are short for their age. And it's really sometimes, a, it, uh, it, it's a, um, it gives you a metric for some of the longer term issues in a country. So you'll see the stunting and know that over time, um, this, this country may have been um, trying to develop and really um, you know, having, having issues with um, just some of the basics. Um, this is a picture from Honduras from beautiful rural countryside as we were heading into a, one of our villages. Uh, but again, they lack clean water, sanitation, some electricity. Again, they cook over, um, over a fire within inside their hut that's not vented. About 3 billion people in the world rely on solid fuel for cooking and heating. After trees, they use things like cow dung, crop waste, and trash. Um, cooking over unvented fires is that source of indoor air pollution. They liken it to smoking about two packs a day. And so that's why in the short term, you'll see problems with upper respiratory illness and asthma, and maybe in the longer term, see cardiovascular disease, cancer, and COPD. Um, so here we go, um, moving forward, that idea of that combination therapy. So we have social activism, political leadership, and financial commitment all coming together and um, the member groups of the UN's World Health Organization have developed these, um, the first, the Millennial Development Goals. And just recently in September of 2015, uh, they um, adopted or created the Sustainable Development Goals and rolled them out um, um, January 1st on 2016. Um, at the international level, the MDGs and now the SDGs um, work within member nations to meet the goals of health for all. So this is just a brief minute um, on the SDGs um, targeted for accomplishment um, by 2030. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try seeing if this works. Justin, yell at me if it doesn't, okay? You got it, Beth. Okay, is it working? It is working. Yay.
go. Okay, I think I can, whoop, there we go. Um, I just um, added some uh, sustainable development goals, um, some resources here. Uh, the homepage gives you lots of information about the SDGs, which are now um, 17 goals. Um, one of the things I really like, and I like to pass it on to a lot of people, is the SDGs for kids. Um, it's a comic book that kind of explains this whole idea of uh, global goals for sustainable development. Um, just some great, um, some great ideas there if you want to um, maybe connect to these. Um, so, so here we are. What in the world happened? Um, the pandemic became everybody's lived experience. Um, we all learned new words like, uh, uh, you know, for our vocabulary, like quarantine, isolation, variants. Um, and we also all um, <clears throat> worked in, and developed some new practices, things, and learned about flattening the curve, social distancing, masking. Um, now we're discussing vaccination, herd immunity, um, efficacy, emergency youth authorization, all those kinds of things. Um, we're entering a new normal, but how about the rest of the world? One of the things I like to challenge people as educated citizens is consider adding a few newsletters that really will get at and give you some information about what is going on in the world. One of my favorites is down here, John Help Hopkins Global Health Now. I, I love it because um, it really um, has links within it. it. It takes you to not only what's going on um, related to COVID-19, but what else in the world is going on. And um, I think in some cases by um, reading more and understanding about what's going on in the world and linking to um, the research that's going on as well, which I think they do a great job of. Um, we can, we can um, break the chain of infection as the World Health Organization calls it, the information infodemic and, and really be part of understanding what's going on. So just a you know, shout out there to John Hopkins Global Health Now. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, in this um, time frame that we have here, there's so many areas that could, we could focus on, focus on as far as what in the world happened. Too many really for one discussion. So I just wanted to focus on a single SDG and then tie it to our past and present and hopeful hopefully future service learning trip this spring. So um, last July, the World Health Organization released this important report, which outlines the challenges to reaching zero hunger by 2030, which is the second um, sustainable development goal. So many important statistics are found in here. Just gonna share one with you. In 2019, 160, uh, 690 million people went hungry. Um, this report provided us with a real grim forecast that the pandemic could add an additional 130 million more to the 690 million. The report studies nutrition across the globe and tracks progress. Um, while, you know, really, um, you know, this idea of hunger was on the decline up until about 2014, when numbers started to rise again, and then the pandemic hit, it, hit us. There's great regional disparities as well, pointed out in, the, um, in this um, state of food security. Africa has about 19% of the undernourished um, population and it aspect, uh, trends are, are showing that by 2030, about half of the chronically hungry will rely on Africa. But that's not to say that there aren't other areas of disparity as well. About 8% of um, those that are undernourished live in Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean, about 7.4%. The economic um, recession, brutal on COVID, um, may actually add another 132 million to those 2020 estimates. Um, unfortunately, hunger, and malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, um, it, it is really, um, there is a, a high cost to nutritious foods and low affordability, especially when you think in developing countries and the severe poverty where people are making $1.25 a day. So um, globally, you know, to switch to a healthy diet is costly, but if we can do a combination therapy, therapy approach, um, we can hopefully create and make an impact and create a sustainable plan. 
Um, this again um, was just published out in um, April, 2021. The UN released their policy brief following that um, July, 2020 report. This is just a visual of the um, previous, previously prevented, presented issue, this regional disparity that you can see there as well. The lockdown, lockdowns disrupted, disrupted food supply chains, um, overburdened healthcare systems, diverted their resources from things like um, addressing malnutrition, um, providing antenatal care, um, providing nutritional supplementation, preventing and treating di diarrheal disease in children and um, caring for people with infections and acute malnutrition as well. All those resources in some healthcare systems were diverted um, to um, COVID-19 care. So the UN is putting um, for forward with their um, food um, system summit the idea that we need to address things like access, sustainability, um, resilience, and equitable um, pay for those working. Um, so then they can also afford good nutritious um, foods. So I'm gonna take us to um, what I consider part of that combination therapy, um, the idea where groups work together to impact health. Um, uh, and our uh, Moravian College connection with Healthy Ninos Honduras. Um, Honduras is a low middle income country of about 9 million people. Life expectancy is on the rise there. It's at about 75. Um, they are, um, have doubled um, the numbers or percentage of people of women who have had attended births from 47% in 1990 to 74% now they're seeing a declining fertility rate and a decrease in adolescent fertility rate, um, which really um, uh, has about half since the 90s. Um, they are also um, great inroads have been made in, um, in that idea of um, children that are underweight. That's been about half. Um, and the under five mortality rate has really made great strides, but again, um, it's partnerships with um, groups like Healthy Ninos Honduras um, and, and activism and, and support from um, international groups that are helping some of those in rural areas where the disparity is the greatest. Um, the other thing I guess I wanted to just um, point out is in a, a health system like uh, Honduras, the, there are many people who have no health insurance and about 1.5 million don't have access to healthcare. They actually have a pyramid type of, uh, you know, a, a visual of their healthcare system. And it actually starts in the rural areas with what's called a CESAR. And that is a center that's really staffed by a nurse. She's their first line person that um, will help, uh, help the rural Hondurans um, deal with an issue. Following that, is typically a, what should be is a referral to a SESAMO, which is a center with a physician, dentist, and other nurses as well. Um, and then following that would be area hospitals, regional hospitals, and national hospitals. Um, in the Ministry of Health, in the, you know, the national health system, where you find these CESARs, the SESAMOs, and these different types of hospitals, um, the entire country of 9 million people, this um, Ministry of Health um, data shows that there's about 29 hospitals. There's about 9.5 hospital beds per 10,000 people. Um, when when COVID-19 um, hit last year, um, at that point, um, again, there just aren't the, the hospital beds. Um, and it's not unusual when you're in Honduras to be, you know, as you're driving um, down the roads, there's checkpoints, um, you know, kind of overseen by military. Um, and basically what, what Dr. Herman told us happened in many cases was people became ill, but the, um, the roads were barricaded because they knew they didn't have enough hospital beds. So they, people were turned back to their villages. Um, the other thing that I remember him telling me uh, a really startling statistic as the start of the um, uh, pandemic, 
last year, um, the entire country of Honduras had 40 ventilators. That was it for 9 million people. Now, since then, we've understood a little bit better about how to treat them and who needs a ventilator and who doesn't. But at that point, they were dealing with a real deficit in their, in their healthcare system. So there's uh, just so you can kind of picture where Honduras is. Um, and um, the Healthy Ninos Honduras through what was um, used to be called the Mama Project has been had a sustained presence in Honduras um, since the 1980s. Um, and uh, here's, uh, well, you know, San, San Francisco de Yehoa is where the uh, Mama Project Mission House is located. Um, and Moravian College Nursing always has recognized the need to understand individuals, families, and communities, both locally and globally. And we found that um, partnering with um, Healthy Ninos Honduras, um, we were able to send, sometimes we could send 16 to 20 um, students um, to, um, you know, to Honduras for a global um, health and service learning experience. Um, just as th some things to think about related to this. Um, you know, this is uh, service learning is really that idea that classroom learning alone can't provide students with the sort of experiences that enable them to develop citizenship and civic responsibility. So that's why it's really kind of, um, it was a founding part of this nursing program prior to my joining it, but how um, it certainly was embraced um, that we would go out into the world and, and see, see what's going on and see where we can help. Historically, there's lots of connections between um, the university. Um, you know, uh, higher education has had a mission to engage with the local community as part of its legacy of social responsibility. And as um, Moravians envisioning, um, you know, our plan going forward, um, also um, thinking of ourselves in the global community as well. Um, service learning can really be a win-win situation. It's good for the um, students, um, it's good for the students as well as the recipients of, um, of the um, learning project. Dr. Madeline Leininger is a nurse anthropologist um, that has had over uh, 60 years of um, influence in nursing, really transformed the way healthcare professionals care for diverse um, patients and families, and certainly um, cultural humility and awareness are just so important in seeing increased um, focus. So getting this course off the ground. Um, what, what actually um, happens is um, we, we meet prior to our trip um, over spring break. Uh, we get to a basic understanding of global health, the sustainable development goals, um, Healthy Ninos Honduras project mission and vision, and um, we, we look at um, some of the understanding, some of the burdens of disease that we may see, health needs and disparities of um, disadvantaged people living in developing countries. And as our focus is um, rural Honduras. Um, uh, Healthy Ninos Hondura, Honduras, formerly the MAMA Project, um, has providing service to Honduras since 1987 began by women at a um, local Mennonite faith community who wanted to impact uh, women and children in Honduras. Um, the mission was born to be uh, uh, promote health and wholeness, working um, at many levels. Um, Healthy Ninos Honduras is well known to the Honduran Ministry of Health, and they have four basic interventions, outreach to find severely malnourished children, um, we travel to remote areas of Honduras that are not typically served by the health system of this developing country. Nutritional education takes place. So we're teaching moms how to prepare nutritious food so that a reversal of acute malnutrition can be sustained. Um, we also empower and teach um, families to raise their own food. And then um, when they return home, there is aftercare with thorough consistent follow-up hopefully they can have permanent change and, and, um, and good health and growth and development for all these children. <coughs> Excuse me. When we prepare to go on the trip, um, we travel and pack very lightly for ourselves in our overhead, um, in our, our carry-on bag. 
And then we take about 700 pounds of donations, many from our generous um, college um, family here, um, toothbrushes, san uh, you know, um, toothpaste, um, things like all kinds of soap, um, any kind of toiletries. Um, and, um, you know, we ca gather some um, toys for the kids um, <coughs> as well as school supplies and baby packs. So um, the next couple of slides will just um, talk to you or get you um, a little bit more into our service learning project. This is the first group that went back in 2009. Um, when we arrived, we organized our donations and prepare medications for the medical brigade's um, pharmacy. This is a picture of our pharmacy for the week. Um, and this is one area of brigade work for the students. Um, it's this idea of, um, you know, pulling together um, what's available and collaborating. Well, that's a big part of, um, and a strength of Healthy Ninos Honduras is this collaboration. You can't really pull a medical brigade together for just a week. And you really don't wanna become a parachute program. One, a group that just brings worse resources together one time and, and you're out of there. This has to be sustained. And that's where um, Healthy Ninos Honduras really has been uh, you know, a sustaining member of um, working in, the Hondur in, in Honduras um, for many, many years, running prior to the pandemic about 30 teams a, 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 you know, a year. Here's what the doctor's office looks like in a typical village. We usually set up in a school. Um, here are some additional um, office supplies. Um, you might see this, I, um, you might see in there, I think the bicycle pump is in there. When we don't have electricity to give a nebulizer treatment, we use a bicycle pump to administer it. Um, all this kind of points to some of these ideas or a principle of creativity that's needed. Um, if you're developing a program, you need to uh, plan your program based on um, the context um, and Healthy Ninos Honduras really makes this easy for us. From our first day of brigades, we all jump in and are part of things um, as we start to, um, um, you know, start up to tear down and pack the truck for the next day's location. Um, we've had a number of different stu um, students on our trip. This is a RNWS student and a traditional undergrad um, working on um, the um, anemia or hemoglobin um, table. Um, here we had a, a, a and a registered nurse and two traditional undergrads that were on our team. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the um, stations that we provide um, service for are uh, vitamin A, um, deworming, distribution of micronutrients. Um, we assist with medical and dental consultations and do some of those very important heights and weights and get, um, get the uh, assessment of all the children and their, um, their nutritional status as best we can. Um, this is just a picture of a couple of our students assisting or observing with an assessment. Um, the Honduran physicians, especially Dr. Herman, when he is on the trip, um, allow students to assist and observe and provide instruction. Um, they really see um, global health administering, um, really gives them a different perspective social justice and responsibility of a longstanding connection to nursing throughout history. And here they see that um, in, in, in reality in a global setting. Um, this just reminds me of, um, you know, one of the really important things that goes on um, on these trips and our tuition, as I call it, um, goes to um, put two cement floors in two homes in each village. The families selected for this typically are growing, are young growing families. They're not just given this, they have to supply the stone and mortar used in the process to help to lay cement if they are able. Um, and, and then we also work on this aspect or, or principle of capacity building that takes place at the nutrition center. When a nourish, malnourished child or mother enter the program, they're taught how to sustain themselves through crop growth, and given a guinea hen to take home so that they have an adequate protein um, source for the whole family. Um, students who help with the cement floors, um, they, they actually um, see the reality of rural life 
Um, they understand the issues by seeing that, um, that unvented um, open fire or stove inside these homes um, causing respiratory illness. Um, they see um, the distance from town causing you know, the reason for some unattended births, lack of water and sanitation leading to diarrheal disease and parasitism. Um, so here, um, one of the final things um, upon return is a, um, is a presentation for the Moravian College community um, and um, some of their lessons learned um, and connections to SDGs. Um, so I, I'm gonna just um, end with a real quick YouTube that the students put together in addition to a presentation. Um, this one just gives me goosebumps every time I, I, I watch it. I'm hoping you guys can see it as well. Okay. Um, And you see it. Sorry about that. I was muted. I, yep, we see Good. it on the screen. Okay, the music starts in a minute. Okay, well, I want to thank you for taking a little trip with me into global health and hearing about our work. 
Um, and I think I'll stop sharing and see anybody wants to ask any questions or discuss anything. Thank you so much, Beth, for the great presentation and uh, giving our alumni tonight a little insight into how our students are making an impact, um, not only within the nursing uh, program at the college, but more importantly, um, within the Moravian community. So really, really appreciate you bringing that aspect in, into uh, the presentation tonight. Yeah, and we, we've taken a number of, um, it's been predominantly nursing students. We've taken public health students, um, sociology majors, you know, anyone can really go on this trip and, and be a part of it and, and have an impact. Fantastic, thank you. And I do at this point want to open uh, up the presentation for any questions uh, that anyone joining us tonight may have for Dr. Gottwalls. And if you'd like to, you can either unmute yourself or you can put that question directly into the chat. Looks like Russell maybe wants to sure. share. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few words. Yes, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't realize I hadn't unmuted myself. Uh, I, I wanted to congratulate you. I thought that was very nice, a, a good overview of uh, global health. And um, I, one of the other things I've noticed about global health and uh, when you were talking about in the 90s, is uh, the number of women who've become involved in global health in, in a leadership role. Mm. And I think that's significantly impacted uh, the way global health has gone, particularly with the maternal and child health, uh, infant mortality, you know, you can go on with the list. Um, and uh, the other thing is, and I think Moravian, I, I don't know how well Moravian represents this, but a lot of young people from these uh, lesser income countries have come to the United States received training in various professional backgrounds, such as nursing and medicine and whatever. And go, but the uniqueness is it hasn't only been a drain, a brain drain. Many of them have gone back to their country and contributed to the infrastructure, which to me is one of the big issues because the challenge here uh, in this whole exercise is how do you help low income countries to develop their own health capacity? Um, and, you know, it's wonderful that we can go and, you know, do things for them. But uh, the ultimate is that they feel independent and can do it on their own. So it's a long road, no question. I, I, and I congratulate you. So oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I guess the other thing that I see too, that is really so important and Healthy Ninos Honduras does it so well is um, the ministry of, uh, you know, we're not, we're not banging into each other with, a, you know, like, oh, another group just came and gave us vitamin A and deworming. You know what I mean? They, they all, you know, the ministry of health kind of has the major players like Healthy Ninos Honduras um, kind of organized around their departments. They call them like Cortez and Yehoa and things like that. So um, depending on where you know, the mission house is located, um, kind of the, you know, the reach is probably a good, probably sometimes almost an hour drive, you know, right. around that area. So that is something that's important. And um, uh, another thing that my, um, Healthy Ninus Honduras does real well is working with these communities. Um, the community, there has to be a community leader. Um, and if anything is, you know, kind of, um, you know, left behind um, some supplies and things like that. A community leader is taking, you know, taking charge of those. And they are starting to, to train um, people within the communities so that um, they can be sustained. Maybe we don't need as many um, persons to come because there will be people trained within their home country that will do some of what we do. I still, I still, I don't know, you know, and there's philosophically, I've heard of that as well. Like if we didn't go, that could have been just so much more money, but yet you send students and they never really stop talking about this trip. Do you know what I mean? So I in that sense. I, I agree. I'm, I, I look at this from my background in the Peace Corps. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm really familiar with the, the, the emotion that it's a lifelong kind of experience like you have and like they will have. But I also imagine you probably see some 
unique people while you're there who, if they had a chance, maybe to come to Moravian and get a degree in this and go back. And I don't know what work has been done in that area, but that's the kind of thing that interests me. Um, that's really interesting. I think, um, Justin, maybe you know more about this than me. I know I've heard about it in the past, but I think that every year, I'm not, I hope I've got this right. Um, someone from Liberty High School gets a scholarship to come to Moravian. Have you ever heard about anything like this? Yeah, I, I believe, and Amanda can confirm, but I believe that uh, Bethlehem Mary School District, they actually award, uh, the superintendent uh, awards uh, two scholarships uh, to two yeah. Bethlehem Mary School District uh, students every year um, that, that come to Moravian. And, yeah. uh, and that's, a, that's a scholarship um, for, for all, all four years of their time uh, through their matriculation at Moravian. And I had heard there was a case where a young, uh, young girl um, you know, came here with, with her parents. And, and um, I think if I understand the story right, her, her mother died and one of the teachers adopted her mm. and she was one of our scholarship recipients here um, from Honduras, which is just wonderful. You do hear of that idea and Russell, you must know, you know, that brain drain that um, right, right, people, right. people need to go back um well that's why i'm thinking someone yeah. who has a relationship from the country coming over as a sponsored student maybe even living yeah. you know, living with a family but then going back um can have an enormous impact um it's always a gamble you never know they may mm -hmm. in their third year they may say i'm not going back <laughs> but uh, that's that's the price you pay mm -hmm. uh, but I, my experience is that there are more and more people from these countries coming and going back to their country and wanting, I think the newer, younger people have a different men mental set. Um, and also the attitude that our country has had about immigrants. <laughs> uh, they almost would rather go back. So um, it's interesting. Life is changing. But yeah. thank you for, for your time and your effort. It's very interesting. Sure. Very good. Great discussion. Anyone else? Any, any comments? Do you want to come on a trip with me? <laughs> Are you worried about security? Honduras um, has real serious problems. Yeah, I know. Um, every year when we, we say we're going there, the parents start to Google Honduras and it's considered <laughs> the murder capital of the world. Um, yeah. I have always felt very safe there. The Healthy News Honduras picks us up right at the airport. And we get out of, um, I think we land in San Pedro Sula. We get out of San, San Pedro Sula as fast as we can. I would um, say out. That, that's not a good place. I agree. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you don't stay there long. We used to go to a marketplace there and they won't even take us there anymore. I guess one of the things that really is kind of startling too is, I mean, everywhere you look, like at the gas stations and things like that, there's people with um, submachine guns or whatever those things are, you know? I mean, the, you know, the, they're armed over there. Anyone else have any um, questions for Dr. Gottwalls? And if anyone has anything that they'd like me uh, to forward to her, you can always reconnect with me um, offline and I'll, I'll put my email address in here just so that everyone has it. Um, and I can always get those questions to Beth and, and get you, um, an answer on those. Yeah. And, um, I think Amanda did tell us that it was a, um, there is the superintendent's um, scholarship. So great. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for attending tonight and thank you for uh, supporting our virtual engagement events all throughout this uh, past academic year. I know it was challenging uh, to, you know, provide the opportunity for some of you that are local uh, to come to campus, but we do really appreciate your support uh, in attending these uh, virtual engagement efforts. And we hope that uh, starting in the fall, depending on what the college's uh, procedures and policies are that we uh, may have an opportunity at bringing alumni back on campus for these alumni engagement type of events. So I hope that everyone has a great rest of your evening and take care and hopefully we'll see you next season.
for returning learn. Thanks so much, everyone.